So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful word. We praise you for your Holy Spirit that you've sent to dwell in us, to guide us into all truth. And we ask that this morning, that we will glory in the revelation of your word and what you are teaching us and the things that you do want to accomplish in this place, in this body, uh, and everyone that hears. Lord, we pray that uh, there will be unity and love and forgiveness and uh, caring and sympathy and compassion among church members today. Just fill us uh, with your spirit and your power and your wisdom and your grace, we ask. And we do praise you for always answering prayer and being the almighty God that cares so much for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So today we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 31 and 32, and we can go ahead and read those. Um, the last two verses of chapter 4 in Ephesians. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is a time uh, ever since man was created and fell and became sinful. There's been times when people are mean to each other and um, fight one another. But in the end times, it's going to get so much worse. And so it is so much worse now. Now, I would just like to draw your attention just to read through a little bit of what's going to be like in the end times. Um, and particularly when a country or a world, for that matter, starts turning to homosexuality in the way that it has and uh, transgender kids and all of the, the sinful nonsense that they're trying to push on the world today. How God responds to this and where people are going, what kind of people are going to be like in the end times. And the trouble is that these things... Uh, work their way into the church where it doesn't belong there, but it does. Uh, but in Romans uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is what people are like today. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. Do you feel like this world has been given up? to a debased mind, to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy and murder and strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. That sounds like a pretty miserable place to live with a world full of people that are like this. And in our day and age, they approve people that live in this sinful lifestyle. And if you don't live in that sinful lifestyle, they declare that you're wrong, that you're a, uh, a hater. And Christians get accused of that, that we have hate speech. But doesn't it sound like these people got enough hate speech? <laughs> they hate God and they hate his people, they hate goodness. They don't want to put God's word in schools like anything like the Ten Commandments that says, do not murder. And they just think, oh, what happened? Kids in school got murdered. 
because they don't want God there. They hate God. And, and they don't mind murder too much when you look at their uh, new laws they're making about abortion where you can still kill a child for any reason up to 28 days after, after birth. And we even have provisions for up to two years. These are the ones that hate. They're, they're hating the ones that uh, love people. They love their enemies. That's what we're told to do. But uh, this kind of attitude, all of these things uh, filled, find their way into the church somehow. And, and that's so sad to see this. And I have seen it. I have seen uh, people take their bitterness and hatred all the way to the grave with them. When remember God says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. <laughs> he says, when you're angry, you can be angry. Uh, God gets angry. Jesus was angry. Let it be for something right. Don't let that anger turn into sin. Because once you start sinning, let that anger fester and don't make peace with another brother or sister of Christ in the church. Then the devil will use that to start people hating each other. And in the church, that happens. It is not supposed to. And that's what we're going to look at today. The church isn't supposed to act like this world. Hmm. So we just have a real simple outline. Verse 31 is the behavior for Christians to stop. There's certain way that Christians are behaving, and so we can have some of these behaviors. And God just says, you got to stop. And then... Verse 32 is behavior for Christians to start. This is how God wants us to be. And then in conclusion, we'll look at some of the verses that just uh, tie it all together. And we also will talk about how this is even possible. <laughs> I've heard people say, well, this is my behavior. This is how I am, and I can't change, so get over it. Um, it's impossible to change. Well, in Christ, we can change. So what kind of behavior are we to stop? The first thing that's listed here is bitterness. Bitterness uh, originally was for the taste of a plant or water that was incredibly bitter. You, you couldn't stand it. And the very root of this world was a pointed, sharp arrow, sharp, bitter taste or a pungent smell like, woof, you smell something, oh my goodness. A sharp or penetrating pain or a piercing sound, you get the point. It's just like enough already, and you want to cover your ears or plug your nose. And sometimes people's speech and behavior is, is like that. When you're around them, you're just like, oh, I don't want to be around you anymore. You, you bother me. You, you hurt me. You're like a sharp, pointed thing poking into me because of your bitterness of complaining about things. And this word uh, bitterness was in the Hebrew when uh, the Greek was translated, the Hebrew was translated into Greek, the Septuagint, in the waters of Meribah in Exodus 15, 23, when the people uh, were without water for a few days and they were getting really concerned. They found water, but the waters were bitter. Ooh, you couldn't drink it. So they got all mad at God, and then God brought them good water to drink that they could drink. But some people are just so bitter, you just can't be around them, and, and that's really sad. Hey, um, Hebrews says, don't let any root of bitterness spring up in you that causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. This root of bitterness that's kind of the start of this whole thing. And, and there does seem to be a progression here, although it's not etched in stone, but this bitterness that just festers within a person, they're bitter about another believer. And we need to think about most of this as talking about believers. And then that bitterness turns into wrath, where they can have explosive anger. They just get so angry and they just explode. And then the anger just continues as a long-term anger. <coughs> Excuse me. And then clamor is shouting and screaming. And then they start talking about the person, making up lies so everybody else will hate the person. And that's slander. And then this malice is just 
all kinds of evil, whatever is evil. So as sinners, um, they're the ones that act like this. All believers, well, we're sinners saved by grace. Uh, we have to watch out, letting this bitterness start in us and just keep festering along. This is something that sinners do, and church people shouldn't be doing it. And then wrath. And by the way, these next two words, wrath and anger, they're both words used of God's wrath during the tribulation that he's pouring about out on this world. So wrath is fury, it's anger, it's maddening, it, it's fits of rage, outbursts of anger. It has more of the idea of being an explosive type thing. These two words are often synonyms, often used interchangeably, but if you had to tag something on them, this wrath is more of an explosive type thing. And then anger is something that just is kind of goes on and on and on. So when somebody loses their temper, that's an explosive thing. People are losing their temper all over the place in this world we live in. Uh, think road rage and stuff like that. Uh, some somebody go into a fast food restaurant and beat up, beating up the person behind the counter because they didn't get their order right, or just you know things. That people are losing their temper over nothing. Um, it's displeasure. It's indignation. Uh, Jesus was full. Uh, the people were full of wrath when Jesus started. <coughs> declaring scriptures that were talking about them. And they tried to uh, throw him off of a cliff. They were so angry. But Jesus just passed through the crowd and escaped their, escaped their hands. They couldn't touch him. And then in Acts 19, there's a situation where the people are coming after Paul. And it mentions great confusion. That's this wrath. They're rushing, they're dragging him out of the uh, place where he was and dragging him somewhere else to try him. And they're crying out, they're screaming and yelling. This is the wrath just exploded at these believers. And then it, it is a work of the flesh. In Galatians 5.20, it talks about all these things. that are the very basic nature of human beings. And then anger just is something that just continues on. And James tells us we're supposed to be slow to anger, not let it go on. And um, Ephesians says, don't let the sun set on your anger. And we're supposed to put it off. We're supposed to get rid of it. And then clamor, clamor is loud yelling and screaming and shouting. When uh, we were at the lake one day and uh, bolted, true to her name, and went after another dog that she saw. And I was holding on very tight, and I didn't let go of the leash, but she did pull me backwards over the picnic table, and I landed on my back, and when I did that, I happened to let go of the leash. So Bolt went after that dog, and, and the man that owned that dog, he started screaming and yelling at Melody with the kids around, and everybody else was in the parking lot at a big park, and I heard him screaming. I thought, no, you can't scream like that. And when I got there, Melody was talking real soft and quiet. You know, like uh, a quiet answer turns away wrath. The man was very wrathful, and, and Melody was just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's a crazy dog, and she finally got Bolton, pulled him away. <coughs> Not to mention the guy was ready to shoot the dog, and he warned him, if you don't stop him, I'm going to kill your dog. Right here in the parking lot where the kid's standing next to the dog. He had explosive anger. He had clamor, and now it turned into screaming and yelling and, and swearing. Uh, he sounded like an R-rated movie, one swear word after another. So clamor and, and swearing and screaming is something we shouldn't be doing. As I tell the kids, don't scream. Uh, the only time you should scream is when one of you are in the parking lot of the road and the car's coming. Or you see a rattlesnake's going to bite you. Then you have to scream. Get away. But otherwise, don't be screamers and yellers. That's abusive speech, and it shouldn't be allowed. <coughs>
And then all of this can turn to slander, and that's the word blaspheme. When people started start making up things about somebody, they, start, they, they make up a story that's not even true about the person, and they start spreading it with gossip. And the goal is to get everybody else to hate that person too, because they hate them. And uh, I've seen that firsthand. People making up things that when you hear it, you go, what? Where, where in the world did uh, <laughs> where'd they come up with that? That never happened. Never happened at all. Uh, false witnesses would be slanderers. It's when somebody is trying to wound another person's reputation by spreading evil reports or evil speaking about that person. You're just making it up. So that's what anger and bitterness and hatred turns into slander. They try to get everybody else to hate the person. Then you're thinking, Christians? Come on. No, Christians do this. And then malice is just a uh, general term for all the mean-spirited, vicious attitude, ill will that a person can have. So how much of this behavior are we supposed to get rid of? If you look at this scripture, it says at the beginning, let all bitterness. And then if you look at the end of the word, a verse, all malice, this little word all, and of course, how does that saying go, the meaning of all, all means all, and that's all that all means. So all manner of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, all of it, let it be put away from you. And then, uh, is there any behavior of like that left? That word put away. That word really means to put it away. That means to get rid of it. That means gone, take away, remove it. In Matthew 24, 39, they're talking about Noah's flood. Jesus is, and he said the flood came and took them all away. Every human being on earth that wasn't in the ark. It's a clean sweep. So when it says, put these things away, along with all malice, all of these things, it means gone. It means we're a new person in Christ and we don't have that behavior anymore. And, and I have seen some uh, people that, uh, uh, one, one person I think of, um, we used to babysit her kids, and uh, she would go out partying, uh, and she would party with a different guy every time she went out, and um, drink a lot. And so we watched her kids, but we witnessed to her all along the way. Um, she was very athletic, played on softball teams and stuff, and, and smoked heavily, and drank heavily, but she had a steady job. But when she talked, oh boy, uh, you just wonder how could somebody like that be saved? She wasn't a womanizer, she was a manizer, I guess you would say. Um, you know, neglectful of her children. And just a hard, hard, uh, foul mouthed woman. And then she got saved. And she made a clean sweep. She started taking care of her two girls and loving them properly. The, the men and the partying and the booze and the cigarettes and the swearing, just like a switch went off. She now knew Christ as her Savior, and her life was changed. She was a different person. Uh, when you saw her at church, you would think, and someone said, uh, you know, there was a time when I could, couldn't stand to listen to her, all the foul mouth that came out of her. And people would say, no, that, how could that be? I, I just can't picture you as that, you know. But um, she made a clean sweep. All of it was gone. In uh, the city of Corinth, the church there, Paul discovered that there was a man having a relationship with his stepmother. And he said, with your stepmother, the Gentiles don't even do this stuff. And he says, you're, you're so proud of yourselves, you're letting them stay in the church. Don't you know a little bit of leaven 
eventually gets to the whole piece of dough, and this little bit of sin is going to creep and grow in your church, and more people are going to be doing it. You need to get him out. You need to have him removed. You need to put him out. You need to cleanse the leaven, and you need not to associate with him. Don't even have lunch with him. Purge the evil person from your midst. That's a clean sweep. What we do with our language and with our, our anger and our hatred, we need to put it out. It's gone. And God says we have the ability with Christ in us, the Holy Spirit, to do that. He's given us the Holy Spirit to do these things that are impossible. Some people, uh, there's a big craze today of wanting to see miracles, healings and raising from the dead and who, you know, whatever. Show me a miracle. I'll show you that girl that we knew that changed her whole life. That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. That's somebody that's a new person in Christ. Um, years ago, Calvary Chapel put out a, a video of a number of their pastors that had been in prison. Uh, some of them uh, real hardcore gang members uh, that had murdered people, and they were in prison for it. Hardcore uh, men, evil men. And now you look at them and their wife and their kids and, and being a pastor of a church, they made a clean sweep of all of this anger and hatred and bitterness. They're a new person in Christ. That's what God does. So those are the things that, uh, in this passage, that God doesn't want us to do. No more bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, screaming, yelling, making up stuff about people, trying to hurt people you don't like in church. Give it all up. Throw it away. Be done with it. And what kind of behavior does he want us to be? Who does he want us to be in Christ? And uh, we could spend hours here, and we won't. Uh, there is so much good information on what God wants us to be. And he begins with this word, be. This is what I want you to be. This is the new you. Uh, this is more than a makeover. You're a new creation in Christ. This is what we're to be now. And, it, it, and this passage begins, this verse begins with the words one another. One another be like this. One another be kind to one another. It's put there for emphasis. It's put there on our relationships, on our fellowship with believers together. Be kind, it begins. That means to be gracious. It means to be gentle. It's the opposite of everything in verse 31. <laughs> All the meanness and the slander and the yelling, it's none of that. This is a whole different person. In Luke chapter 6, uh, we see this at work. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus speaking. He said, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. You know, partying, drinking buddies and everything. And just friends. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. So <laughs> here it comes. This, this is what it means to love, to be kind. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Boy, I let him my lawnmower and he never gave it back. And your reward will be great in heaven. Wow, your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful in the evil. God is kind, we're to be kind to those that are ungrateful and those that are evil. And some people see other believers as ungrateful and other believers as evil. Be merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. 
God wants us to be kind to one another. God is kind. In Romans 2, 4, it says, God's kindness leads us to repentance. When we were still sinners and, and enemies of God, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And when we hear that, that it should uh, strike a note in us, my goodness, God is so kind to me. I didn't deserve for him to be kind, but he is anyway. 2 Peter 2, 3 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is kind. He wants us to be like him. Experience his kindness so we'll be kind to other people. And then the riches of his grace in, in right here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In the coming ages when we're in heaven throughout all eternity, we're going to look at Christ's immeasurable riches and all of his kindness that he shows us. And I think we'll be saying forever, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve, God, for you to be this kind to me. You have given us so much. You know, that's why um, God makes a, a lot of emphasis in the scriptures, don't stack up material possessions and things in this life, because afterwards, once you're there, you're going to look back and think, what was I doing? Look what he's given me. And I saw a movie uh, where this guy was very rich, and it was at a high school reunion, and he was the richest guy of all. He didn't drive there in a Ferrari or anything. He came there in a helicopter. And some girl that he always wanted to have in high school, well, now he approached her, and she always rejected him. And, and uh, he said, I have everything in the world I want except one thing. And she said, your own island? <laughs> well, no, he can have his own island. He said, oh, I, you know, you're the one thing that I never got to have that I really want. And, that was so nice and sweet. But can you imagine being as rich as some of these uh, Elon Musk or Bill Gates, where you could just buy your own island, where you could have your own country, and everybody would do what you want? You could have a different car every day of the week. You could have a wardrobe. And not only that, you could have uh, people there sewing them and making them for however you wanted them to be. All these servants and everything. Well, throughout all eternity, when we see what God has given us throughout all eternity, we're going to be thanking him for his immeasurable grace and his kindness towards us. Because the richest person in the world, to have this whole world, is not going to compare one bit for what God is going to give us in heaven, what we're going to have there. Just being able to be in a body that does not break all the time, and a body that never gets tired, and never gets hungry, and it never gets annoyed and irritable, and has to deal with all these sinful nature within us and everything, uh, that'll be just incredible. And to be with God himself, and knowing that he loves us, and that uh, Christ has gone up into heaven and, and spread his blood on the altar in heaven to save us. He's so kind to us, so we should be kind to one another this incredible, kind God that we have. Because God was kind, he saved us. So be kind, he says. And then he says to be tender-hearted. Uh, that originally meant to, to have healthy inward organs, a heart, lung, and liver. Uh, that's what it originally meant. Then it, then it came to mean uh, more of a display of sympathy, sympathy that grows from within. And, and mercifulness uh, towards other people that comes from our heart. It's often translated heart, tender-hearted, soft-hearted. It's opposed to harsh and hard and bitter and sharp. Everything that bitter is, this is the opposite, and this is how God wants us to be. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, 
God talks about having a tender heart towards people. He says, by this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has this world's goods, and then he sees his brother in need, and yet he closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. So t to be tender-hearted would look at a brother in need, and I have the means to help them, then being tender-hearted, I will. I'll reach out and help that person. But if we're not tender-hearted, we'll just say, hey, I'm praying for you. I don't, you know, I hope you find a good field to sleep in tonight. I hope you find something to eat. Yeah, our heart goes out to you. If your heart's really going out, you'll buy the person some food and buy them clothes or put them up, whatever they need. You'll take care of them. Christians are supposed to take care of one another. When Jesus saw large crowds of people, he felt huge amounts of compassion, of, of being tender-hearted towards those people. He would see them as sheep without a shepherd, and he wishes that they would just trust him as their Messiah, and he could cover them with his wings and take care of them. When he saw a huge crowd, he felt compassion, and he healed everybody in that crowd. He healed them all. And then he fed them, over 5,000 people. It was probably more like 20,000 and then a leper called to him one day. And a leper, you didn't want to be around them in those days because they were contagious and they didn't have the medicine that we do now. So a leper said, please have mercy on me. And Jesus was moved with great pity. He was moved with being tenderhearted. And he reached out and he touched the leper. And he healed that leper. He felt compassion for him so important to have a tender heart. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 talks about having a tender heart. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. And in our scriptures today, in the previous verses of this chapter 4 in Ephesians, is talking about being unity. God has made us a body, a complete group of people that love one another. We all belong together. We're all joined by the Holy Spirit within each one of us. So he says, have unity of mind, and have sympathy, and brotherly love, a tender heart, and there's the word, tender heart, and a humble mind, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For he whoever loves life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And this is one of the hardest things for a person to do. When somebody is mean to me, does evil to me, for me to immediately want to turn and do it back to them. And sometimes I talk about the cats, because they're a lot like people in some ways. Particularly when they get to the dinner table, and you put the food out. And there's certain cats that usually are the instigators. And they'll take their paw and they'll put it on the other cat's head and just hold it there. Like, this is my food, not yours. And most of the cats just back away. But there's a few who aren't going to take it. And then she puts her paw on their head and bam, she, another cat will whap her. And then she'll jump down off the table. Well, maybe she did them evil and they returned the evil. They've been reviled, and they're reviling again. You mostly see this, uh, I see it, in the kids. Well, why are you crying? Well, because he hit me. Why did you hit her? Because she hit me. <laughs> she hit me, so I'm going to hit her. 
then this happens every day. <laughs> and they all learn the lesson, and they all say, I forgive you, and they all hug, and they'll play together fine until the next uh, returning evil for evil. <laughs> and it happens all over again. We're supposed to be tender-hearted, not returning evil for evil. In the book of Philemon, the story about uh, this man Philemon, who was a slave owner, and the man named Onesiphorus, Onesimus, Onesimus was his slave, and Onesimus stole money from him and ran away. And he went and found Paul. Somehow he got connected with Paul. Paul led him to Christ. So here's a slave that did evil to his master. He stole from his master. Paul said, whatever he stole from you, I'll pay it back. And, and then he takes off and leaves him. He's gone. So Paul writes Onesimus a letter. He knows that Onesimus is a good believer. He's a, he's a Christian. And he pleads with with Philemon to please let Onesimus come back. He's saved now. Don't hold his sin against him. I want you to be tender-hearted towards him. And that word tender-hearted is three times in this little book. In verse 7, Paul says, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The hearts of the saints, their tender hearts, they've been refreshed. They've been encouraged. They've, they've been helped. They've been made to feel better because that's how Onesimus is. So Paul's going to plead to him. And then he says in verse 12, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. I'm sending my very heart. He has been such a help to me. I just hate to let him go, but I know rightfully I need to send him back to you. And then in verse 20, he says, well, to back up a little bit, in verse 17, so you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. He's asking Onesimus to receive somebody that done him wrong. This is a personal thing. His, his slave, Onesimus, hurt Philemon. He ran away from him and he took something. He took some money or something. But he says, when he comes, I want you to receive him just like you'd receive me. I don't want you to keep your eye on him to see if he's going to steal something. Because if I came there, you wouldn't keep your eye on me because you know I wouldn't steal anything. Well, he's saved now. I want you to receive him just like you would me. And if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Don't worry about it. To say nothing of your owing me, your own very self, maybe Paul led him to the Lord or saved his life or something. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. He says, Philemon, you refreshed all these believers, all these saints. I want you to Refresh my heart by receiving Onesimus and not holding his sin against you. Don't hold that against him. Be tender-hearted towards him. I think that's a beautiful illustration of being tender-hearted to somebody that has wronged us and not holding it against him. And then we are to be forgiving. And we could go a long time on this, but Christ forgave us. We're supposed to forgive other people. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, put on then, that, and that's what it's talking about in Ephesians. You used to be like that. Don't be like that. Make a clean sweep. Now this is how you are to be. This is what a Christian is like. So he says, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, and that's the word, and kindness, we have already seen that word. That's the same word in Ephesians. Humility, meekness, and patience. We're to be bearing with one another. That's because sometimes we're unbearable. We have friends that do things or say things that just annoy us. 
We all have different temperaments. Some people are very artistic and slow and methodical. Some people are very just, just very quick and, and just get it done. And they're not very artistic. And each will be frustrated by the other. And, and some people just all over the place, just want to do everything and help everywhere. And, but then kind of never gets anything done. And another temperament just is kind of slow and steady and plodding along. And they annoy the fast person that wants everything done now. And so if somebody, if you have a complaint against another, forgive each other. Or the kids will come and they'll say, I have a complaint against him, her. Well, why don't you go forgive her? But you don't understand. She or he wrecked my so-and-so or did something. Well, you have a complaint, forgive the person. That's what a Christian does. Forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. And above all these things, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And that's what Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to be getting along in perfect harmony. We're living in a time when people are intentionally trying to divide the church, trying to not get, let us get along in perfect harmony. This is the times that we live. They want nobody to look at them. I watched that movie Conspiracy Theory the other night. Uh, them, who are them? Well, you know, they, they, you know who they are. They're they. Well, I guess we kind of do now. It's uh, uh, Elon Musk or World Economic Forum or Bill Gates, you know, the Bilderbergers and uh, all these rich families of the world. It's they, you know, all, all of them. They don't want us to look at them. They want us to be fighting against each other over wearing a mask. By the way, I read last night that especially the blue masks, there's so many particles of plastic in those that the people that have had lung cancer recently, they're opening them up and their lungs are full of this blue plastic particles coming from the masks. Watch out. <laughs> they want us to argue about these things. Well, I think I should be vaccinated. Well, I don't. So people are going head to head over these things. Or I think we should have guns. No, I don't. People go head to head over these things. Um, your skin has more pigment than mine, so I don't like you. Your skin doesn't have as much pigment as mine, so I don't like you. So we're all fighting together. We're not living in perfect harmony. Christ says, let the peace of Christ rule in your own hearts. So when the world tells us all the stuff to fight over, don't let them rule our hearts, let Christ rule our hearts. Because we're all called in one body. Well, we don't have one body. We got Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and uh, no denomination and, and vineyards and Calvary chapels and how many kinds of Baptists are there? But we really all are one body. It's so good to see the school, the homeschool ministry, when the different parents and, and different kids are all coming from different bodies, different churches. We're all serving Christ in the same body. We are one body, and we're not to be divided. And then uh, Titus chapter 3. how we used to be and, and how we're to be now. Laid out very clearly here. Chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, remind all the people, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Do we always see that in a church where every believer is showing perfect courtesy to another believer? I've seen some pretty bad things. Somehow we're all the same family, but we all always don't get along. When I worked 
in a casino and security. Uh, we did notice that the people that fought the hardest were the ones that had a warrant out for their arrest or ones that were on parole and going to go back to prison if they let us catch them for the crime they just did. But you know who was the worst of all to, to the security of the casino? Were its own employees. I, I never got cussed out so much by a customer than I did by our own employees. And uh, that was kind of surprising, but you learn. In a church, you see people, one believer against another, being so cruel and so evil and hating that person. It's so not right. God wants us to avoid quarreling to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves, one time we were foolish, we were disobedient, we were led astray. We were slaves to our passions and pleasures. We passed our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hated one another. That's the world, hating each other and everybody hate you. But, Here's the thing, but God, but God, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, and our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works which we have done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and a renewal of the Holy Spirit. He poured all of this out richly and lavishly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have become justified by his grace. We're now heirs of our eternal salvation, of the, of the hope that he has for us. So all of this fighting and clamoring, this needs to be stopped, a clean sweep, pushed away. But we've been washed, we've been made clean, we're new people in Christ. And when we do sin against one another, that's what Christ says, you're supposed to forgive each other. Which of my sins has Christ not forgiven? I, I told that time um, in a Bible class, we were studying Colossians, and it says that God has forgiven us all our sins. And I was sitting next to this hippie friend of mine, and some of the other students looked down on us because we weren't saved and raised in a Christian home. We were hippies, oh my goodness. Not anymore. But my friend Bill reached over and he circled that word all, all of our sins. He just looked at me, yeah. All of our sins have been forgiven. Christ forgave them. Why don't we forgive one another? He did it for us. We're supposed to be doing it for one another. And how is this humanly possible? Well, it's not. We have a new nature, but if we try to do it on our own, in our own strength, we're still going to get angry, we're still going to fight, we're still going to return evil for evil. And here's how you not. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk by the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Live your life by His power. And when you do that, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. That means absolutely not. In the Greek, it takes two words for no and puts them together. In English, that's a double negative. But not in Greek. And it uses one word for no, and that means, well, you know, it, it might be possible. And then I've used the other stronger word for no. Well, it's, it's probably not even probable. But there is a chance in a million. When you put them both together, it'll never happen. It's virtually impossible. If you walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will absolutely not gratify the desires of the flesh because we're living by the power of God in us. And all the works of the flesh, the sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, all these words that we li listed today, are a lot of them are here. And then this fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, self-control, Kindness, same word for kindness that we looked at. All these are fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
So we have the Holy Spirit, we have a new nature, so it's entirely possible. It's just something we lear have to learn how to do. But to see Christians fighting and then being angry at another believer and never giving up on that anger, that is so wrong. We don't have to. And God says, don't do it. He's telling believers in, in, in Ephesus that we're already doing it. He's telling them to stop. So when we do it, let God tell us to stop, and he will. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for knowing all about us. Thank you that you understand us and the sinful nature that's still present in us. And thank you for making a new nature and giving us your Holy Spirit so we can change and be different people in Christ. And we pray that in each heart, Lord, you will encourage us to be merciful, to be kind, to be forgiving, to be tender-hearted with one another, just like you have been with us. Help us to do that with other people. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.